This is a true pleasure for Ali and I. We get to talk to gentlemen who played for the University of Oregon back in the early 60s. He was also a member of the Dallas Cowboys for his entire career. He was a 10-time Pro Bowler, a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Mel Renfro. How are you doing, Mel? Doing great. Doing great. How about yourself? Great. We talked to your former teammate uh, at Oregon the other day, Dave Wilcox, and he mentioned that you got you could do it all. You played offense, you played defense. The only thing you need to do was uh, clean the dorm. <laughs> I could do that too. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I was very versatile in, in high school. Uh, actually, I, I played uh, almost every position. And my senior year, I actually played quarterback. So, uh, you know, offense and defense. So it just uh, kind of came easy for me. Now, in high school, the quarterback that you replaced happened to be Terry Baker, who, who went on to win the Heisman Trophy at Oregon State. Yeah, was, there any tempta- was there any temptation to also go to Oregon State? Well, I was two weeks away from going to Oregon State. Actually, I had planned to go to Oregon State, but uh, two weeks before it was time to report, my parents sat me down and said, you're not going to Oregon State, you're going to Oregon. And I, <laughs> I, I suppose... Uh, uh, Bill Bowerman and Lynn Casanova got to my parents <laughs> some way and convinced them that I should go to Oregon. So, you know, I I, I was going to do what my parents what my parents' wishes were. So I ended up at Oregon. But two weeks earlier, I was headed to Oregon State. Your fullback in high school was pretty good too, uh, Ray Renfro. Yeah, actually, I thought he was a better football player than I was. You know, he was six three, two hundred and fifteen pounds. And could run like the wind, uh, but uh, unfortunately, he he fell on some hard times and wasn't able to go any further in high school. Now you mentioned Bill Bowerman, who was the legendary track coach at Oregon, and you were an outstanding track athlete. Later on, he he was one of the founders of Nike. Did he ever give you a stock tip and say you should buy Nike? No, no, he didn't, uh, uh, and I don't know why he didn't. I think he kind of owed me. I was uh, <laughs> part of that 1962 uh, uh, NCAA championship t- uh, track team, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I gave him a lot, and he probably should have, but he didn't, and I, I never questioned him on it. I saw him many, many years later, and we visited and shook hands, but, uh, you know, that, that's part of, of, of what it is. At least you should get a free pair of gym shoes every year. <laughs> well, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, I think Nike, not Nike, but Adidas came after me. Um, well, they came by to uh, uh, Thousand Oaks training camp with the Cowboys and handed out a lot of free Adidas equipment, and uh, I wore a lot of those, uh, uh, those, you know, uh, shoes and whatnot during my playing career. So that's kind of a little payback to to Nike for not, you know, doing more for me when they had an opportunity. What was playing for Len Casanova like? Well, you know, Len had an excellent uh, group of coaches and, uh, you know, different position coaches. And Max Coley was my my coach. And, and, you know, Len was the boss, but Max kind of taught us the ropes and told us what to do and and pretty much uh, took care of us. And, uh, but Len was, uh, you know, he was a teacher and uh, he was tough. You know, he wanted you to do your job and do your job right. And if, if you made a mistake or did something wrong, he would, you know, he didn't have any favorites. He'd come down on you no matter if you were at the, at the, at the, one of the best or, you know, just a mediocre player. But uh, Len was a very fair guy and uh, well liked as a coach. Was there any thought of you trying out for the 1960 Olympics? Because I see all the state records you broke in Oregon. Uh, well, the the uh, uh, 64 Olympics was on the on the on the on the table, and uh, as a matter of fact, I was training for the decathlon, and and you know, and, and playing football and training for the decathlon and going to school and raising a family, uh, it, it was just a little too much for me, and I chose uh, a pro contract in, in the National Football League rather than. Uh, you know, staying and, 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 and training for the Olympics. It was just a little little too much for me to handle at that time. During your junior year, Oregon uh, traveled twice to Texas. The first game was at the University of Texas, second game at Rice. When you initially went to, 
to play the Longhorns, there's the story of you getting thrown out of a soda fountain. Was that your first encounter with racial discrimination? Well, uh, yeah, actually, actually, it was. Uh, you know that I had noticed or encountered. Uh, it was a situation. Uh, you know, and, I, and my memory doesn't doesn't help me here at all. But uh, yeah, we were told what what we could do and what we couldn't do, and and you know where we could go. And and Lynn tried to keep everybody together as a team. So we we were very cautious about how we moved around as as an entire team. But you know, it it worked out okay. We uh, we had a uh, an outstanding game against the Longhorns right up until, you know, late in the third quarter when I think we ran out of gas. It was We weren't used to that Texas heat. I think it was in the 90s at night. And, you know, we're used to playing in 50- and 60-degree weather. Uh, and uh, we were leading them, and uh, we made some critical errors right there late in the third quarter, and they just stuck by us. They were, they were rated number one in the nation that year, and we had a, a good opportunity to beat them, but we let it slip away. And you got to play against Ohio State and Woody Hayes during your career also, right? Yep, yeah, played against them twice, uh, my uh, sophomore, uh, junior and senior year. And uh, just, uh, uh, it was, you know, when we got there and uh, we went into that stadium and there were 80-some thousand screaming Ohio fans, and uh, it, it was a hard uh, challenge for us. Uh, but we, we battled. We battled as hard as we could, I think. I ended up with 15 unassisted tackles uh, and uh, 23 or 25 tackles altogether, and I was playing free safety. You know, I just remember that big fullback coming up the middle, and the first thing I saw was his knees coming at my head, and it was uh, quite an experience. But uh, we had two great games against them, and, and uh, you know we battled them. They were tough, and we battled them. But uh, you know we we did we gave it all. We gave everything we had on the field. Now, going back to 62 season, uh, your family is initially from Houston. You go back to play Rice in what was a, uh, a whites-only stadium, and then they set aside a, a special area for your family. What, what was that? What goes through your mind when, when all that happens? That game was very, very emotional for me. Uh, for being, being born in Houston and coming back and, 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 and playing in an all-white stadium, uh, it's just remarkable, and and I guess I was so had so much adrenaline in me, and I was so pumped up. I probably had one of my best games ever. I, I think some of the uh, news reports read uh, Renfro runs rice ragged, uh, and uh, it, it was great to see. Uh, I can't remember how many of my uh, relatives were there, but no, my grandfather was there, and uh, just to, I didn't get to. to talked to him, but I, I went over as close as I could get to the stands and waved to him, and I, th- I think I probably teared up because of, uh, of what a special game I had, and what a special moment to have uh, relatives there that I hadn't seen in such a long time, and uh, and having such a great game, so it was just a wonderful experience and something I'll never forget. And you had some issues with uh, racial problems at a hotel in Virginia, too, with your team, where they wanted to you guys to stay in a separate hotel? Uh, you know, I, my memory doesn't, doesn't help me there. I, I, I know we had a problem somewhere, and uh, I don't know whether we, we moved went to a different hotel or what, but, you yeah, know, there, there were some issues, and, uh, of course, it was taken care of, uh, I guess, discreetly, because uh, I, I don't really recall uh, right now how, how that went down. Did you ever want to play quarterback in college? Because I know uh, Bobby Bell was very successful, and they won a championship at Minnesota. No, no, I, I was I was very satisfied with with uh, course we had a great quarterback and Bob Barry and, and Doug Post, and uh, you know playing a wide receiver and running back and and and, and safety, uh, I had my hands full. And you know back in those days, they, you know, you didn't play uh, one. One position, uh, one. You didn't play offense or defense. You played both. You stayed on the field the whole time. So it was it was tough to do. And I was a, a punt returner, a kickoff returner, and uh, playing offense and defense without ever leaving the field. And sometimes, you know, when you run an 80 yard or an 80 yard touchdown, and then you're out on the kickoff team, 
and then you're in it on defense. So that's the way it was. But we we uh, we endured, and uh, we had some some great teams. In the 1964 NFL draft, you're a second round pick, the 17th choice, which would be a first round pick today. Did you know that the Dallas Cowboys were going to be choosing you? Well, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I thought maybe uh, uh, the Redskins or the 49ers, I thought, was where I, I might go. But after, uh, you know, being passed over in the first round because of the, the rumor that my hand was cut off or something, and, uh, and Dallas was the one that held up the draft for, I don't know, eight or ten hours, and uh, then they passed over me and, 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 and drafted Scott Appleton, and then they traded him away before the draft was over and then immediately picked me up in the second round. So I, I don't know what their theory was there. It may be some deception, but uh, they ended up with a, a first-round draft choice in the second round. Definitely. Did you have any thought of playing running back with the Cowboys, or did Landry basically want you as a cornerback safety? I came in as a running back a wide receiver. But they had a, a, a host of – Running backs, uh, Jim Steiger, Amos Marsh, uh, wide receivers. They had a ton of wide receivers. And, and Landry didn't feel like I would be able to start my rookie year. So he said, well, I'm going to put you on defense and see what you do. And immediately the defense just improved tremendously. And uh, 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 you know, I was returning punts and kickoffs. Actually, my first two years I gained more yards returning kicks than my running backs gained. So my third year, my first year I was free safety, and my second year I was strong safety, and so I, I would, had such success returning kicks that Tom decided to, after a media push, uh, Tom decided to move me to offense my third year. So actually I started my third year at running back, but was injured in the first league game, and uh, I broke a bone in my foot, and so I didn't play for oh, four or five games, and when I came back, the foot wasn't just wasn't right, so uh, I just couldn't make my cut. So Tom decided to put me back on defense and put me back, back in at free safety, and I played the rest of the year at free safety and still went to the Pro Bowl. And the next year, they, he put me at cornerback, and that, that's where I played for the next 10 years. Which did you like better, safety or cornerback? Well, if I had stayed at free safety, I'd have probably intercepted 100 passes. I, uh, I loved the challenge at cornerback in the man-to-man -man coverage. And actually, I, I was so good at it that uh, in 71, 72, 73, I had almost no passes thrown in my direction. Uh, when after they, uh, we'd play a game and they'd grade the film, they'd, they'd grade me on pursuit because they were always throwing the ball in the other direction. And as a consequence to that, I didn't get the interceptions, and I didn't wasn't able to after my tenth year. I wasn't able to earn Pro Bowl status because there was just no action over there. But not not that I wasn't the same, uh, wasn't a good cornerback. It's just that if you get no action and you get no statistics, uh, you're not going to end up in the Pro Bowl. So uh, ten years was it was a good run, and uh, I appreciated that. You had another uh, Olympian who played wide receiver for the Cowboys in uh, Bob Hayes. Who covered him in practice? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody okay, who who, who Bob Hayes. tried to cover him? <laughs> he, uh, yeah, no, I, I had a technique where I, I was a reader. I, I, I would read the quarterback steps, and uh, I, 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 know, I knew the patterns. I knew his moves. So, you know, I, I just uh, get back about 15 yards and – and wait for him to make his final move, then I'd, I'd go after him. But just just running, to try to run to keep, keep up with Bob Hayes, you know, you just couldn't do it. And one thing about me, I had tremendous quickness. I, I could outrun Bob in a 40-yard dash, but between 60 and 80 yards, he'd go by me very easily. So we had a tough time covering in practice, and, 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 and you know, the, 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 our opponents had a difficult time covering him any time. Yeah, but you were running, you were backpedaling, and he was going full speed ahead. Well, you line up 15 yards deep, and you back up, and you read, try to read his route, read the quarterback's drop, and, you know, you just go for it. I hope you got some deep help. 
you had a number of Hall of Famers on that team, but it seemed like the leader of that defense was Bob Lilly. Was that correct? Well, uh, actually, uh, you know, Bob was the key number one player for us, uh, but the leader was Leroy Jordan. And he, he was the team captain, and he was the play caller, and he was tough as nails in that huddle because, I tell you, he, he growled and said, man, we're not letting them in the zone. And he'd say that 100 times a game. In every play, we came out with a purpose to stop them, you know, not let them score. And Leroy was pretty much the, um, you know, the trooper that uh, got us going with that. Did you, have a favorite, yeah. did you have a favorite punt return that you made? Uh, say that again? Did you have a favorite punt return during your career that, that stands out in your uh, mind? You know, uh... I wouldn't say I had a favorite, but I had uh, 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 one. Uh, the fourth quarter of the Pro Bowl in 1971, I ran back two punts for touchdowns, and uh, they named me uh, offensive player of the game, offensive MVP as a defensive back. And the, the first punt, uh, it was a short kick, but it started bouncing down around our 12, 13 yard line, and the. The other team uh, kind of relaxed, and I scooped it up and psh, right up the middle, 83 yards for a touchdown. And and just a few minutes later, there was a short punt. I fielded it on our 46 or 44 and, and, and cut left and then cut back right, right and went 56 yards for another touchdown. So that was uh, interesting to be able to score twice on punt returns in one quarter. You were in Super Bowl, let's see, 5, 6, 10, and 12, and you won right. two of them. Did you have a favorite Super Bowl? Well, I, you know, I'd have to say that uh, the favorite would be Super Bowl 6, and mainly because we won it. You know, we, we shut down Paul Warfield and, you know, Jim Kick and, and, and Zonka and, and Greasy, and, you know, and everybody had a good game. Bob Lilly was all over Bob Greasy and, uh, our cornerbacks shut down their wide receivers and and, uh, and and finally winning. You know, we had a reputation for not being able to win the big game. And uh, we finally won the big game and and uh, got the monkey off our back. And so that, that was by far uh, the most exciting. But, you know, Super Bowl twelve was my last game. And actually, I had a bad knee that year and didn't play very much. Matter of fact, I didn't play the last six, seven games of the season. But then the first quarter of that Super Bowl, I think uh, Benny Barnes went down and, 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 and Mark Washington was the backup. And Mark was over rubbing his knee like he couldn't go. And uh, Gene Stallings said, no, he said, Pro, he called me brother Pro. He said, Pro, can you go? So I went in at early in the second quarter and played three quarters of the game. Uh, and we ended up winning it, uh, you know, pretty precisely. And, uh, uh, I was very thankful that I was able to, to play in that last game because it was my last game. And, uh, you know, to win a, a world championship in the last game and retire, you know, it just doesn't get any better than that. Not at all. Did you know that was going to be your last game going into the Super Bowl? I, I kind of felt like it was because my knee was, was totally gone. It was, uh, you know, I had the, the cartilage removed. I think in, in April, just before training camp, and I really wasn't supposed to play much, and it just wore out during the season, and uh, I felt like I couldn't play anymore, unless they moved me inside to safety. And they weren't going to do that because of Cliff Harris and Charlie Waters, and those guys were pretty permanent fixtures there. So, uh, And they did drafted Aaron Kyle as a number one at the corner, so they wanted him to play. So I, I felt like I was on my way out anyway. What was Tom Landry like as coach? Well, he's tough, tough, smart coach, uh, no stone unturned. Uh, he uh, was a very strict, uh, a tough taskmaster, but he was fair. You know, he and, and he he a great teacher. He 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 taught he taught us all, you know, how to be how to play our position as 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 good as, good as we could. And, and not only did he, he taught us to, to be good football players and, and to work together, he, he also taught us to be better people, better men. 
and, uh, and and we most of us realized that after we retired that the influence he had on our our lives and and the way that we uh, we turned out as, as as men you know after retired and and we give Tom Landry a lot of credit Coach Landry a lot of credit for that for for strengthening us in in faith and, um, and you know and, and consistency and. And uh, you know we just he's just a great man, a great individual, and we all we all after the fact loved him dearly. Is it true that he never swore? You know, one time we were practicing, uh, and he was demonstrating a linebacker move, and he tripped and fell on his face, and uh, he got up and he said, "Gosh darn!" And then <laughs> everybody just broke up. So that's the closest he came to a curse word was gosh darn. As a former defensive back himself, did, did he pay more attention to the defense and especially to the defense in secondary? Well, no, no, he didn't because uh, uh, he, he, although he was a defensive, uh, came up as a defensive back and, and was a defensive coach, he, he concentrated on the offense and the multiple sets and all the movements and different things and uh, and Dick Nolan was was a, was a great backfield uh, defensive back coach. He did a great job. And uh, of course, when Gene Stallings came in, he took over and learned, uh, you know, what he needed to do. And 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 so Tom didn't didn't concentrate that much on the secondary, but uh, the entire team and the offense uh, was main. The offense was main, his main baby. And of course, he kept an eye on the defense to make sure that. You know everything was in order. What receiver gave you the toughest time? Uh, you know, guys that could run faster than me. Uh, like you say, I, I was running backwards and they were running forward. Uh, Paul Warfield was good, but you know, I, I learned Paul's routes, his tendencies, and uh, was able to cover him well. You know, Roy Jefferson when he was with Pittsburgh and then the Redskins was was good. Uh, Cliff Branch, the Raiders. Could flat out fly. I mean, I, I bet he could be run as fast as Bob Hayes. Uh, and guys, guys like that, uh, uh, Mel Gray, uh, guys that could run really fast. It was really gave me the, the problems, but I, I didn't have uh, d- too much difficulty in covering them. Was there any particular quarterback that you enjoyed going up against? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I loved to go up against Sonny Jerkinson. I mean, the guy was a pure passer, could throw the ball extremely well, but I think my rookie year, I picked him off twice. Once in the first game that we played him and ran it in for a touchdown, and then in the Pro Bowl at the end of the year, I picked him off again and ran it in for a touchdown. So uh, he's a great passer, easy to keep, but, I mean, he could throw the ball uh, extremely accurate, and um, he loved to pass. And, uh, you know, I, I played against Joe Namath one time, and, I, I thought he was a good, very good passer. You know, Y.A. Tittle, uh, he, he was at the end of his career when I played against him, but I thought he was an uh, uh, excellent quarterback in his heyday. And, of course, Johnny Unitas, uh, loved Johnny Unitas, grew up watching him. And fortunately, my rookie year, um, uh, I intercepted a couple of passes against him when we were in Baltimore. And, uh, but I always remember Johnny U as being one of the greatest. You had Warfield's number, though, because you said he had that hitch and you knew exactly where he was going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, uh, but, you know, I just admired him my, my, uh, growing up. And, uh, of course, being able to play against him was, was just kind of a dream come true. I know one game you want to forget is that 1970 game against the Cardinals. What was it, 38 to nothing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, probably the worst experience we ever had of course we were beaten by the vikings in the preseason game like 53 to 14 but we came back that year and did extremely well but yeah uh, that that was a nightmare uh, i think that was on national tv and um uh but you know we didn't lose the game after that you know we we, we won the i think my phone is going to go if my phone goes dead on me we'll just you just call back okay okay yeah but go ahead yeah, that was Monday Night Football, and when Monday Night Football was just getting started, and it, it was a huge television event. Did you did you have an idea that this was something different from just another game? 
No, 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 I didn't. Not at the time that we played it, but I, I knew that after we lost the way that we did, uh, Coach Landry took kind of a, a, a different attitude toward the practices and uh, the meetings, and he kind of loosened up a little bit and uh, it t- told us to relax because I think at the time we were like four and three, and to, to, to him that was kind of like the season's about over. So he, he relaxed, and, and like I said, we never lost another game, went right on to the Super Bowl. Who was the best player you ever saw play? Uh, Joe Montana. Joe Montana uh, and Jim Brown. I just, you know, I think Jim Brown's the greatest running back to ever play the game. I mean, I, I, I've tried to tackle him. I hit him as hard as I could, and just he ran right over the top of me. And uh, a guy that big, it, it, nobody ever ran him down from behind ever in his career. But me, one time in the Cotton Bowl, uh, chased him 73 yards, and he, he admitted. He said, he said, he said, Mel, you're the only guy that after I broke loose had ever run me down. And I just, you know, I appreciated that compliment especially coming from a, a guy that I thought was the greatest running back to ever play the game. What's amazing is Sam Hoff's got a picture in his office of him tackling Jim Brown. Bob Lilly, one of his pictures, him trying to bring down Jim Brown. It seemed like that he was the guy that all the great players felt that if they could get bring him down, they accomplished something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, he was, uh, uh, you know, I, I grew up watching him and, and, and to be able to play, uh, against him, and then being able to play with him in a, two Pro Bowls, uh, that that was a highlight for me. And uh, having get to spend quality time with him at the Pro Bowl was really uh, exciting for me. So you're a 190 pound defensive back trying to bring down a 232 pound running back. How do well, you do that? Well, you you, you 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 hit him and you hold on and you, you pray for help. And I tell you, that's what I did many times is that I hit him and he was running over me. Just I, I know one time I grabbed his leg until two or three of my teammates came to help me take him down. When you got inducted at the Hall of Fame, how did you feel? Well, you know, it, 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 what I think what excited me the most was those thousand cameras out there glaring in on you and you you knowing that everybody in the world is looking at you and that you have become one of the greatest players to ever play the game and you're in a fraternity with the Jim Browns and 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 and, you know the Lenny Moores and the 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 Paul Hornings and you know Herb Adderley you're in, in in an elite group and the whole world's looking at you and your family's looking at you you're your fifth grade, uh, grade school teachers looking at you, and it's just a wonderful feeling knowing that you've accomplished something, and you've kind of reached the mountaintop, and uh, it's just a, a great honor and uh, probably the highlight of my life. Now, a, a lot of your teammates from Oregon refer to you as Melvin. When when did you go from Melvin to just being Mel? I grew up Melvin. You know, any, everybody in Portland, Oregon, uh, grade school, uh, high school, call me Melvin. At least my person, my, my my family and friends, close friends. One of my English teachers at Jefferson in, in Portland tagged me Mel one day, and that kind of went viral. But, but you know, up till this day, my friends I grew up with call me Melvin, and, and you know, all my family members call me Melvin, and. And you know, uh, uh, you know, Dave Wilcox calls me Melvin, and I talked to Bob Barry uh, about a week ago, and he calls me Melvin. So it's uh, the close ones call me Melvin, and the not so close ones call me Mel. Did you guys enjoy being called America's team? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, that was uh, we were America's team. Well, not only because we we were winners and successful. That uh, you know, Gil Brandt and Tech Tram did a great job of, of promoting the Cowboys to developing the cheerleaders and their scouting program, where they went on all the couches and went to all the colleges and uh, got the became friends with the co- coaches and, and gave them the, the the cheerleader calendars and the pins and 
frequent visits, and um, uh, so I think that was it. It, it wasn't uh, just a uh, you know it, it, it wasn't by chance that we became America's team. It was by design. I, you were elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1996. Fifteen years earlier, you were entered the Dallas Cowboys Ring of Honor. Did you wonder what took Canton so long to come calling? Well, uh, I, I, I kind of knew what happened there. I, I just, uh, uh, I just kind of wanted to let the sleeping dog lie. That when I retired from the Cowboys, it wasn't a, a friendly departure. And uh, there were some things that happened that, that, that uh, there was a little bad blood. And uh, so it, it just happened that, that somebody didn't want me in the Hall of Fame for a while. And, and until that, that, that person didn't have anything else to do about it, uh, you know, then I went in. Herb Batterly made a comment that he was mad at Tom Landry, that Landry didn't start an all-black backfield with cornerbacks and safeties that you guys only had two African-Americans playing in the backfield, whereas the Packers had four. But we kind of brought up to him and said, this is Dallas, Texas. They shot the president down there. What do you think they would have done to Landry? Do you agree with that? Well, you know, I, you know, uh, Landry wasn't, wasn't perfect. You know, he tried to do what he thought was best. And he probably along the way made some mistakes and uh, made some decisions that that weren't correct, uh, but you know nobody's perfect, and he wasn't perfect. And, but you know you look at you look at all the positives that came from Coach Landry and, 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 and all his contributions. Uh, they they really kind of overshadow anything that was probably negative or something that that was done that uh, you know people don't agree with. Are you still doing motivational speaking? No, I think I think because I, I stopped that up a couple of years ago. I, uh, you know, they've got these these issues now about the concussions and, and 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 the memory things. I'm I'm having some memory issues of short term memories, and sometimes I just don't trust myself to get up in front of a group and and go through a speech. So I kind of stay away from that. But you know, I do do interviews and I get out and do appearances and autographs. I do charity events, but I just don't don't do speaking. I'll tell you one thing, Landry accomplished. He kept Tony Dorsett under control as a rookie, and that wasn't easy. Yeah, I know. I remember <laughs> that was my last year, and I I remember the the, the goings on. But uh, yeah, they they kind of 